So I wanted to introduce our speaker today. Her name is Lisa Vincent. Lisa is a DSW, and in case you're not familiar with what a DSW is, it is a Developmental Service Worker. Um, Lisa, uh, we're joined today by Lisa by Community Living Essex County. She joined Community Living in 1996. Her understanding of diversity, equality, and inclusion guarantee her success in her role as an employment support professional. Now, before I turn it over to Lisa, I just wanted to um, check in and do a little bit of housekeeping um, so that we can be able to uh, roll through questions when the question and answer period happens. So first and foremost, if you would just look at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat function there with a little bubble. So throughout the presentation, you'll be able to type in any questions that you have, and I will be able to see those, and I will stop Lisa from talking and ask those questions. So you'll notice that uh, my colleague, Leslie Ellis, has just typed in, hi everyone. So if you want to just type in your name or where you're from or your organization you're representing, um, what school you go to, whatever that is, it's, uh, if you wanna type that in now, that would be great so we know everyone has that option to ask questions. Now, if you don't want to ask questions through the chat option, we will have an opportunity at the end for questions and answers, and we can unmute ourselves and ask those questions verbally if you want. And if you don't, if you don't want to ask any questions today, but decide that you want to email me a question that you have for Lisa, please do so, and I will get the answers for you from her. Now, I wanted to thank you for joining our Mentorability Canada Project Summer Career Series. Um, again, this is our fourth week, and it has run since July 9th, and it will continue to run every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until August 27th. So please continue to tune in every Thursday at 2 for a different speaker who will speak about their career journey, and you can ask them questions um, as it pertains to you. So during this session, please do keep yourself on mute um, because the, black, the background noise does interrupt the speaker when they're trying to get through their career journey. Again, just a reminder that the session is um, being recorded. So if, if you are not wanting to be on record, please shut off your audio and video now. Now, I just want to introduce my colleague, uh, Lisa Livingston. She's on the line now. If you want to just give a, li a little wave, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is with March of Dimes Canada, and Odin and March of Dimes Canada have joined forces to bring Mentorability Canada Project to Ontario this year. And next week, Lisa will be our host for the session next Thursday because I will be away. Um, so at this point, I would like to turn it over to our speaker, Lisa Vincent. And it would be a good time to shut your, your sound off now if you have it on. So Lisa, welcome. Thank you I'll very, turn very it much, over. Amy. Awesome. This is great. Thank you so much for having me. I have to say that uh, mentorability, when I was used, had called and asked about this, and this is a very last minute piece that I'm, I've been asked to do this. So I do not have a formal presentation, I, but I'm very passionate about being a DSW. So if I talk too much, ask me to stop. Um, if you have questions, please, oh, it could happen. <laughs> if there's questions, please go ahead and ask them because that's very helpful too. Um, so mentorability, I hadn't heard of that prior uh, prior to use calling and had had a chance to kind of look into it a little bit. And what a cool opportunity for anybody who is on the line, I think for students, I think for people who are even in the industry, I think people who just wonder about, you know, what other industries are out there and it, it's so awesome. And I have to say, I kind of wish there was something like this when, when I was a youngster and trying to figure out what it was that I was going to do. Um, I always knew what I was going to do. I guess I, I had written a few notes based on some questions. Amy sent me some questions about here's kind of information that everybody's looking for. And so I, I made a few notes and a, just an idea of, of what kind of information to give you. And I have to say I'm scrapping it now because I, I just would like to, I'm just going to start talking. Um, regarding the mentor ability, so when I was in grade six, so it kind of starts out my journey. 
when I was in grade six, um, I went to a very small rural school. Um, we did not have anybody who had disabilities who went to our school. It, it, it wasn't like today um, where there's so much inclusion in the school systems. Um, and when I was in grade six, there was, I don't remember why it was, but somebody came into the class and asked for volunteers to, to, to come on this, to volunteer for the day, come to this place and kind of see what goes on there. And I don't know why, but I shot my hand up and so off I went. So it turned out that we were going to volunteer. There were three of us going to volunteer at um, a school that was strictly for people who have developmental disabilities. Um, did not know what I was getting into, didn't know what this meant. I went and spent the day there and I went home that night and I said to my mom, I know exactly what I want to do. And it never, ever wavered. So as I went through high school, I, I made sure that my classes kind of directed that way. And I was always asking, what kind of schooling do I have to take in order to be able to work with people who have disabilities? And people gave me suggestions like nursing or psychology. I should go to university for social work. And I'm like, ah. So I'd look them up and it just didn't seem to make sense to me. And then when I was in high school, um, this school that I had gone to that was strictly for people with disabilities, it changed over the years and it became a junior school with our public board. And in that, so now we had people, students who have disabilities were integrated into the classrooms. There was also a section of the school that was um, strictly for people who have um, um, severe disabilities and so who, who wouldn't be able to be integrated into the classrooms. So I spent a lot of my time while I was in high school, um, they were right close to each other. So all of my spares, all of my co-ops, I spent an awful lot of time down there. And there was a, a gal who kind of became a, a mentor. She was somebody that I was in awe of, just her ability to, um, the supports, supports that she provided, the kind of person that she was, I, I felt like, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to, I hope I can do it as well as she can. Anyways, she is a DSW, um, developmental services worker. So that's how I learned about the program. And I, I looked it up and saw what kind of schooling it was and thought, yes, this is exactly it. So when I was finished high school, I went to uh, St. Clair College and I got my DSW, so developmental services worker. And that has allowed me to be able to work anywhere where there might be a person from zero to death um, who has an intellectual disability. Um, so people talk about, there's many people who don't know what the difference is, what is disability versus uh, uh, an intellectual disability. So intellectual disability or developmental disability means that somebody's brain development was delayed during those developmental years. So from zero to 18 years when the brain is developing, something has occurred to cause a delay in the growth, the development. So it may be somebody was born with a particular condition or a syndrome um, that, that might be in effect. Perhaps there was a, an accident um, within those early developmental years that may have caused the brain to then uh, not develop at quite the pace that maybe somebody else's does. So, um, so anyways, so then I, so I was able to achieve my DSW. Um, I finished that there schooling. And when I was 18, um, while I was still in high school, I started, uh, I, I went with the group there to Special Olympics. We have a regional meet that is in our area and that was every year at the university. And so I would go with the group there from, from that there school. And that's where I met uh, a woman who her son has Down syndrome. And she said, oh, your personality, I really like it. We are looking for an in-home worker. Um, would you come and be our in-home worker? And so I kind of started my career at that point, right? I, I, I was, uh, hadn't gotten my schooling yet, but now I started my experiences. Now I started really gaining a lot of information about kind of what this all means. Um, and so for quite a long time, I did in-home work. Um, so those are private contracts where somebody needs supports and services of some kind within their home. It's often a respite piece, so it's a chance for families to be able to um, uh, have some time uh, for themselves, right? So is that their, their loved one now has a, a support worker who can take them out to do all sorts of things, lots of skill building, lots of community participation, whatever involvement that might be. 
Um, from there, I was hired by Community Living Essex County. So that is an agency that provides supports and services to people who have intellectual disabilities. Um, the, a person has to have that diagnosed to be a diagnosis to receive supports through us. Um, so I was hired as a direct support professional, a DSP. Um, my DSW, so my developmental services worker, is the training and education that I received in order to be able to get this position. Um, while I was at Community Living, well, I still am. So while at Community Living, I have, I've been with Community Living for 24 years, um, and I've had a number of different roles. Um, my DSW has allowed me to work in such services as our accommodation supports. So that's where maybe folks, uh, they no longer live with their family. So adults no longer live with their families, um, and, but they still need support 24 hours a day. And so they live in a, um, it used to be called a group home. These are now residential locations where accommodation support is provided. Um, so I worked midnights, I worked part-time, I then received a full-time position. Um, from there, I moved into our day supports. At that time, it was called day supports. So folks who maybe don't work, um, they're not in school anymore, they're adults. Now, what do we do with our day? Um, and so there are day programs where people can go to and a, a number of different um, activities and events occur there. Uh, skill building, lots of skill building. So I went, um, went to day supports and I worked there for quite a number of years, um, gained lots of experiences. From there, I moved into SIL. SIL is Supported Independent Living. So folks who want to live out on their own, but they still need some support of some sort. Some folks live on their own. Um, some folks live with uh, a roommate um, in an apartment or in a house um, with some supports. And that support is, it's very individualized. It is different for every single person. So you know, for some folks, maybe I was helping with uh, budgeting, um, medical appointments, advocating for medical appointments, learning how to cook or do laundry, um, helping somebody get back and forth to work, um, counseling, a lot of counseling, so problem solving and relationship um, troubleshooting and problem solving through relationships with friends or with a, a loved one. Um, did an awful lot of talking, an awful lot of counseling. Uh, from there, from the SIL, I ended up moving into our employment services. So providing supports to employment services to people who want to work. Um, they have that self-motivation, want to have a job in the community for competitive pay, just like anybody else who is working, but maybe there's some reason they need some support with that. So perhaps it is um, being able to talk with employers about the uh, benefits to inclusive employment. Maybe it is uh, job coaching. So it's helping a person to be able to learn step-by-step -step their, their job, their tasks, uh, what their day looks like, um, breaking some of those steps down, maybe modifying those uh, tasks a little bit so that somebody can do it and, and be a success to their, their employer. Sometimes my role is being a bit of a communication bridge between a person who has a disability and maybe coworkers who don't have any experience working alongside somebody who has a disability. Um, so sometimes I just need to be that bridge. I sometimes just need to um, be a bubbly personality that kind of helps people to feel comfortable and then progress that into, you know, taking on uh, so those natural communication networks kind of develop between the person. Sometimes it's me making sure that my bubbly personality stays hidden and I be in the background so that uh, uh, natural, again, natural networks can, can form. Um, uh, we assist people with uh, any um, uh, back and forth that they have with ODSP. So my role currently is, no, I'm going to say my role through the entire career has been vast. A DSW or a direct support professional who's working in the disability sector is going to wear many, many, many hats. Um, I'm going to say through the 27 years that I've worked in this field, I can say I've been a teacher, I've been a counselor, I've been a nurse, I've been a chauffeur or a taxi driver, I've been a chef, I feel like I've been a baker, um, <laughs> I feel like I've, got, I've been a painter, <laughs> I've laid carpets. So when somebody gets a new apartment and when I was working in the supported independent living, somebody is moves into a new apartment, well, we need to clean that. So 
Chicago. I've got great custodial services um, and teach people about that. And with teaching is doing, right? The best way of teaching is being able to do or working alongside somebody and helping them to break down these. So it's never talking over, but um, uh, working alongside. Example is always, I find the best way to be able to teach anyways, or to be able to learn. Um, so yes, I've worn many, many hats. Um, and as a DSW or anybody who is working in this field, definitely you will. Um, one of those questions, Amy, that you sent was what type of skills or personality traits? So no, you don't have to be really good at cooking and you don't have to be really good at painting and you don't have to be really good at all of those things that I mentioned. What a person does need to have though is um, we have in Community Living Essex County, there are, um, it's a bit of a, uh, we call them core competencies. So these are the skills and traits that each person as a direct support worker um, needs to be able to have. So if they're going to be good at their job, right? And so there's some very key ones. Some of those are fostering independence. Right from the very beginning, I had learned, or I always have told people, my job is to work myself out of a job, or that's my goal, is always to work myself out of a job. My hope is that I teach the skills that a person needs. And please keep in mind that every single person is an individual person. So every, no disability is the same. Sure, they're similar traits, but they're, no person is exactly the same as the next. So this isn't working on an assembly line in a manufacturing plant. There is no, um, uh, like a, a checklist that says, this is how you provide the supports. It's every single person is going to be different. And so my ability to, or any DSW or direct support professionals, a uh, uh, goal is going to be, how do I um, look at this person, break it down to how do they learn best? How do they process information? How can I provide them the best support possible to help them accomplish whatever goals it is that they have set for themselves in their life? And every goal is going to be a little bit different. Um, so that's kind of the beauty is that you're, you kind of never get bored. Uh, it's changing all the time. Again, you're not working on that line in that manufacturing plant where you're doing the same thing day in and day out. Um, my days are very, very flexible, very, very uh, diverse. They're very different. Um, that's kind of the cool part about this. So some of those skills and traits that I think, personality traits maybe, that I think um, any DSW should have or will need to have if you're doing this job is, um, well, you're going to have to have those interpersonal skills, that ability to be able to talk, to be able to um, uh, connect with a person, um, the ability to be able to explain things. Um, written, the written communication is very, very important. There is a lot of documenting in this in this industry, a lot of documenting. So you do need to be able to have some good communication skills, written and verbal. Um, fostering that independence, so helping somebody to uh, achieve the goals that they want, um, that they have set out for themselves, and trying to help somebody so that I'm not the doer, I'm not your mom, I'm, I'm not the person who's going to do everything for you so you can sit back and watch TV or whatever it is that you may be doing. That's not my role. My role is let's do it together so that I can teach you how to so that I'm not needed anymore. Um, advocacy. Uh, advocacy is a huge skill that is needed in this system and it's advocacy in many ways in many areas. So if I am working in our residential locations then I'm usually assisting somebody with their their medical whatever medical needs they might be. So it's being able able to advocate to a doctor what is needed or um, what isn't needed and then maybe being able to in my current role in employment a lot of times it's advocating to families for the person for their loved one um, especially some of the young ones who are fresh out of high school and newly going to be starting a job families are still wanting to protect that person right they want to they want to do for the person so I do an awful lot of advocating for that person to start becoming an adult, learning the skills that are necessary to be able to um, do for, their, for themselves. Because maybe one day they're gonna be living on their own and, and having their own life and, and you get to be mom and dad to come and visit or whatever the situation might be. Um, advocacy is huge. 
helping a person to learn to find their own voice so that they can advocate for themselves, extremely important. Um, and every person has a voice. So there are, you, you may have experiences with a person who has an intellectual disability, who is in a wheelchair, who doesn't use verbal language to communicate. And maybe somebody has told you that that person doesn't communicate at all. I'm going to say that they're wrong. Every person can communicate in some way. Your job, my job as a DSW or as a support worker is to figure out what is, how does that person communicate and how can I, how can I learn their language so that I can help them or I can help others to be able to understand that language. It's um, every person can communicate. So you just got to figure out which way it is. Um, problem solving, creative problem solving is going to be a huge trait, a, a huge skill that you need to have. Um, it's very, very important. When we have, uh, we've itemized how it is that people uh, do whatever task. So you have a task, um, most people do it however it might be, right? This, 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 and this, they do it. So we know that maybe there's this person who processes information a little bit differently. Um, they, they're not quite able to accomplish that task in that way. So now you as a support worker, me as a support worker, or as a DSW, my job is to figure out what is the best way, how do we break that down so that a person's going to be able to accomplish whatever it is we might be thinking of. Um, whatever task it might be, um, or living on your own. So here we have somebody who uh, struggles with telling time. How can they possibly live on their own if they don't have a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister waking them up in the morning? Well, now our job is to figure out a way. So let's get creative. Let's do some problem solving. Let's break it down and find all those different ways that we might we might be able to. So the, the term in community living ethics isn't, uh, you know, there's when something comes up, we approach every, every problem, I guess, or every, we approach it as how might we, how might we make that happen? How might we accomplish that goal? Uh, and so it's never a, I don't know that we can. No, no, it's how might we be able to do that? Um, and so that's pretty important. Uh, that one's a very important one. Resilience. Um, if you're going into this field, you need to be resilient. There are, there are long days. You work on holidays. <laughs> you work midnights and weekends and afternoons, and it doesn't matter how much time you've put in. You're going to be working those there shifts because, again, this is not a manufacturing plant that closes down on the holidays. These are people that we are working with, and people are live from 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week doesn't matter if it's a holiday, they still have their needs and we still have to provide those supports. Um, so resilience is definitely one of them. Um, there are folks who get frustrated and they're going to take it out on you. There are families who are frustrated with the system and, and you're going to hear about it. Um, there are bureaucracy that is out there um, and you're going to have to be a part of that too. Politics plays into it. Um, for the most part in the disability sector, we're funded by the government. And so a lot of our supports and services that people receive, they're going to be, um, it depends on the, the funding that they are getting from the government. And sometimes that causes, we know what needs to be done for this person. We know what supports needs to be, we know what service they needs, but if, if, if they don't have the funding or if, if the, uh, if the resources just aren't there, yeah, it can get pretty frustrating. Um, I'm going to say those are, that's the piece I don't care for. Amy, you've got something you want to ask. Yeah, I just want to ask a question. Um, one of the questions that comes up is, what is the absolute best part of your job? You're obviously really passionate about it, which <laughs> as you're talking, as you're talking, because I've, I've also worked in this role in my life, and as you're talking, it's bringing up all these passionate points in myself as well, which is, is so great to hear. Um, but what are the, the really, the best part about your job? And what is the absolute worst part of your job? The absolute best part of my job as a DSW who is working as a direct support professional in the disability sector, the absolute best part is when somebody accomplishes whatever it is that the goal is that they've set for themselves. That is the best part. Um, 
there is, and, and, and that, that has been different all the way along. And there's hundreds of them because of the number of people that I've provided supports to. Every person has them. They're not always every day. Um, sometimes they're far and few between, depending on the person um, and what their goals are. Um, but I'm gonna say that is the best part. Uh, there is a fellow in my current role as an employment specialist, there is a fellow who, um, he really, really struggled with employment. There was a lot of failures. Um, and, and, and I was told, caution, there's, there's a lot of failures. Um, you only have so much energy, watch where you're directing your energy to. Well, I take that as a challenge because there's, we just haven't figured out the best way to support this fellow. And so I, I made it a, a, a goal, as I do with anybody, get to know him. I needed to get to know him. I needed to get to know the syndrome that he has and how is that affecting how he processes information. I needed to understand some of the dynamics at home. I needed to understand what was happening at each of these jobs that he seemed to fail at, that he really struggled with. Now, what kind of relationship can I develop with him so that um, we can work together and we're gonna have a success? We did work together. We, we worked hard at it. Um, it took a little while, um, but there was a, a letter that his family sent to the agency that said, um, you know, thank you to Lisa because she wasn't giving up on him. Everybody has given up on him and we knew that he could do it, but we didn't know how it was going to happen. And look at that. He's so successful now in this job. And, and for me, that is, it's like, it's like a Christmas morning. It's a Christmas morning moment, we call them. It, and there's and there's tons of those. Um, there was a gal, and she is working, and uh, uh, the team would go to Tim Hortons each morning. And so this gal would they would ask her, um, did, "Did you want the?" Because she got a donut the first time she went. She, yep, she got a donut. Well, they kept paying for her, and finally I said, "Why are you paying for her? Because she she makes her own money here." And so I, they said, "Well, you know, because she's never offered money." I'm like, "Well, have you asked her for it?" So. So I, I asked them, um, or I explained it to her. Hey, they're paying, they're using their own money. Um, and she didn't realize that. She just thought the food shows up and so she's happy with that. And so now they're going to ask you each time, just like they do the rest of the team, you get to decide, do you want to have something or not? And then you'll have to pay for it. And do you, yep, she understands that. And so when, I, when, when they asked her, what would you like? One of the other fellas who worked at that location said, oh, she's going to get such and such, such and such. And so I said, have you asked her? No, no, that's what she always gets. And I explained to him because she, when they asked her, she got something different and he was shocked, absolutely shocked. And I explained to him, as you would with anybody else that you're working with, you would respect them enough to ask, hey, I'm going to Tim Hortons, what can I get for you? Would you like something? Um, and then that person will tell you and they make a decision. Yep, we go and we get our double-double almost every day, but sometimes I want that vanilla chill. And, and, and but that's up to me to decide. And so I said to him, you could ask her a hundred times and she could tell you the, the donut is what she wants. You still have to ask on the hundred and first time because maybe on that day it's gonna be a muffin. You have to respect her enough to be able to make her decisions even if they're different from what they were yesterday, or even if they're the same as what they were from yesterday. Um, and so that is the, that I find is the definition of inclusion. It's the definition of respect. And if you're going to work in this field, you can't view people with disabilities as people with disabilities. All the disability means is that you, is that they process information. You have to understand that they do process information. But beyond that, the fact that they process information differently, they're still a human being with all the same feelings that we all have. They want to live life the same as we all do. They have goals, they've got um, hopes and dreams, and sometimes they want to sit and veg on the couch, and sometimes they want to work, and sometimes they want to be with their family, and sometimes they don't. And it's up to us to help them accomplish whatever that might be without holding their disability against them. and causing them to appear as sub sub or below us in that human level. We need to be able to respect everybody um, as equal. And, and if you can do that, then I think you'll be a good DSW. <laughs> That's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. So what is the absolute worst part 
I really struggle with that one because I really, really like what I do. Really like what I do. And as everybody does, when we have frustrations in our job, um, so I have to think back, I too have frustrations in my job. And what is it I'm frustrated about? And I'm going to say the most frustrating part is the bureaucracy part that occurs in the sector, um, the politics that come into play, the, um, the, the financial limitations um, for somebody so they don't get the supports and services that they need, or we only have so much finance and so therefore it has to be put to this and this. Those are the kinds of things that I'm going to say are frustrate me the most. It has never ever been about the people that I support even the most frustrating person. And there have been a few and days I've thought of taking up smoking because I thought ah, I'm going to pull my hair out. <laughs> but with each of those, I find that to be just a fascinating challenge. Huh, how can I break through this puzzle? How do I figure that out so that I can provide them the supports they need? What is it that they need from me? Um, so it just goes back to the what I like the most. <laughs> I kind of turn all of that, uh, turn that around. <laughs> So if I know you've said a, a few things during your presentation in regards to my next question, but if you were to be speaking to anyone on this line who is looking at a career in developmental uh, service work as a developmental service worker, um, whether that be transferring from occupation to occupation or for someone maybe in school still who's looking at options, what would be the course of action? And I, I know it's different for everyone, but in your recommendation, what would say, what would be the best course of action for that person to move into such a field? In the disability sector, you can, uh, you can have a few different, there's a number of different schoolings that you can take, educational pieces. Um, so for an agency such as ours, a community living agency, and there are a number of different organizations and agencies that provide supports and services to people with intellectual disabilities. Um, because there are so many different types of services. So within our organization, they don't hire just DSWs. So generally it's anybody, if you have a human uh, uh, education and experience in a human services field. So nurses, um, social workers, uh, PSWs, um, there are a, a number. So child and youth worker. Um, so if you've got uh, some schooling and background in that, then you can, you can definitely apply to positions in the human services. Now, if you want to have education that is um, really directed strictly to people with intellectual disabilities, then DSW is a, a route to go. I think that if, it's, if this is something that a person is serious about, then maybe speaking with a DSW, call me, I'll happily chat. <laughs> um, being able to call the HR that is at any one of the organizations that provide supports and services to um, volunteering. There is, if you're not sure if this is something you would want to do, I have to say when I was in grade six, I don't know why I did because here I was, I was with people with profound disabilities, the, the area that I was in. So here we were, we, there were people who were belching and, and drooling and I'm eating my lunch and I didn't know how that's, how do you even do that? I had no experience with this, nothing at all. And so for whatever reason, it still pulled at me, it called to me, but maybe there's others who would say, oh, now that I've seen it, I'm, I'm not so sure this is something I can do. So volunteer. Every organization is looking for volunteers. We, we need people, we need help. And so, yeah, I would, that's the route I think I would go. Okay, perfect. Um, I think I interrupted your presentation. Sorry, I have background noise. Um, <laughs> I, think I interrupted your presentation, but um, if, you have, if you have additional um, content to add, please go ahead. But if not, I will open it up to question and answer period. Let's let's do the question and answer because, like I said, I don't have something formal, so I could talk for hours. <laughs> okay. So um, has any questions if you could please ask Lisa now if you feel comfortable speaking please take your uh, your audio off mute if not take the opportunity to write it in the chat box now Hi, Lisa. My name is oh go ahead um, 
my name is Sophia and I actually have a learning disability. It's called dyslexia and I really admire how you were speaking about a lot of people and how everybody is really different. I go to a school with a lot of people who are different and I can tell you from my certain experience, it's really hard when people don't really understand that I'm not that good at reading, I'm not good at writing, but I really try to say, hey, I'm, I'm just as capable as the next person. So I want to thank you for just being respectful about how you said it, and that means a lot coming from myself and coming from what I've been through being in a school for people who have learning disabilities and everything. That means a lot coming That's awesome. from you. That's awesome. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I, I, it sounds like you're a gal who you've, you're learning to find your own voice. That ability to recognize where you need some help and then being able to tell people, here's my strengths and here's what I can do. Um, it's just this other little area and truly it'll be just a little area. So keep on doing what you're doing. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Lisa Livingston, I think you had a question too. Hi, Lisa. Hey, um, Lisa. Lady <laughs> with a great name. <laughs> uh, it sounds like, as you said, that you've known this is something you wanted to do for a long time and you um, had um, exposure and experience, etc., cetera, um, along the way, alongside your training that you were doing. So, Given all of the knowledge that you had um, going into this field, what surprised you or um, what did you not expect or what was, you know, maybe different than your expectations going in? So as you were asking that question, I had a couple things that kind of popped up in my head. So when I first went into this field, um, and I was young, I was 18 years old when I started working in the field. And I, I guess in my own head, I thought supports just meant um, if you work at community living, then you work in one of their residential locations. Um, or you work in with a family in their house where the, their, their child still lives at home and you provide respite support. I thought that's all there was. So then moving into the field, I was very surprised at the vast amount of supports and services that are out there. Um, and so being able to broaden my thinking of, so I was surprised about what? Somebody with a disability can live on their own? Nowadays, I think, what was I thinking? How could I be so close-minded or so my, uh, my knowledge was really very, very small. Um, and I kind of wish there was a mentor ability where I could have known so much more about what this field means. Um, working in employment services is, has been a huge eye opener for me, um, for myself, like it's growth for myself, as well as what it is that I can uh, provide for anybody else who wants to work com competitively in their own communities. Um, for myself, I do wonder if somebody so when you're working in employment services, being able to speak with employers on a business to business level, um, they don't want to, we're not looking for charity jobs. We are saying here we have an employee, an employee who is going to be an asset to your company. They are going to make your company that much better because you've included them into your workforce. Now, how do I how do I help? How do I help somebody to understand that and adopt that way of thinking so that they can then emphasize that within their workforce? I didn't, I didn't know if I had that ability. I don't have a business background. I don't, I've never been a car salesman. I've never worked in retail. Those, I wonder if having some of those skills or some of that background or maybe some courses in that area um, would be helpful so that when I am trying to approach it on a business to business standpoint, not from a social services standpoint, but business to business, that maybe I can do it justice. Um, I do fantastic in teaching somebody their new job, uh, teaching people how to communicate with their coworker who has a disability, breaking items down, breaking tasks down. Um, it's, the, it's that initial piece of it that is a bit of a struggle for me that has 
it's definitely caused me to have to come out of my comfort zone. So growth, growth is everywhere. And I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> uh, no, I definitely, I think you gave us some uh, insight into, as I said, what you weren't expecting. And so thank you for that. Um, I just wondered, Lisa, if you could explain what your day would look like. A typical day as a DSW, and I know that there's lots of different um, avenues, like there are residential, there's employment supports, there's day supports. Um, so you've already explained those kinds of things, but just choose one, I guess, and break it down what a day would look like. And if somebody was entering the field, what would they expect their hours and shifts to kind of look like? And I know that's different organization to organization, but just for you. So that is, it is difficult to answer that question because it truly will, each day will depend on the person you're providing supports to. Um, my position here in employment services is so diverse, so flexible. It really depends on where somebody is working, what kind of uh, supports they need. So if somebody is working uh, midnights, they get a job working midnights, and my role at this point is coaching them, then I'm working midnights. If, um, if a family needs to, uh, if they're working and the only time that they can meet is in the evenings, well, then I'm shifting my schedule around to work in the evenings. So it's really difficult to talk about how, what a day would look like in employment services. So for during COVID, um, when businesses went into lockdown, when our, our whole world went into lockdown, um, there's four employment specialists who work here at Community Living Essex County. Um, we were all pulled out of employment services because we can't go into businesses. We can't meet with families. Part of the emergency orders dictated that you can only work in one location. Um, so we were, uh, we were deployed back into residential supports. Um, it had been many years since I'd been in residential supports. And so it really took me back to this is why I came into this field. So I'd like to, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say what my average day looked like there, because I think it's a little bit closer to somebody newly coming into the field. Your, if you're newly coming into the field, likely you would be working in residential supports. So my day was, I worked 10 hour days um, and that was because of COVID. It doesn't necessarily mean that you always work 10 hour days. Um, they did happen to be days, but uh, I, so when I arrived, there is, uh, people are sleeping. Um, there, as people are waking up, there's medications that need to be given. Um, and that is a, a very, very specific way of doing it. Um, training is fantastic on, on how to give it. Um, what, what y'all need to be remembering, we, we, it's so, so important that we're giving it the right to the right people, the right way, the right medication. Um, so uh, there's medications to be given, baths uh, and showers for people, breakfast, so I do a lot of cooking. Um, there's cleaning up the house, uh, disinfecting, there was a lot of disinfecting. Disinfecting is even pre-COVID. Um, you've got four people who live in the location in that, uh, in that home. And there's a number of support staff that come in and out. So making sure that everybody is uh, safe. So we're cleaning the environment. Um, money. So these are people who, uh, they live in their own home there. We are providing supports. Their money is on location. We want to make sure that their money is kept safe. So part of my job is to make sure that I'm counting that money every day and that it is documented and hasn't changed, that it's, it's always still there. Um, families were calling. Families weren't able to see their, their sons and daughters or brothers and sisters during this time. Um, they couldn't come and visit. So we did an awful lot of trying to figure out how Zoom works and Skype and Facebook Messenger and being able to connect so that they could have face-to-face -face conversations with their family members. Um, uh, a lot of talking on the phone. Here's an update on what's happening with the day. Um, I was introduced at this time to some medical supports. I hadn't had that. So a person who has a G-tube, a feeding tube, um, that was new to me. Um, so, so being able to clean that and change the bandages and uh, being able to um, make sure that the tube is in properly. Uh, catheters were very new to me. And so being able to provide some of those supports around catheter care. Um, 
doing a little bit of physiotherapy. So we have three fellas who um, use a wheelchair as their mode of, of transportation, as their mobility to get around. And so to keep those muscles active, then we're doing lots of stretches and exercises. Um, now we also had lots of fun. I went to three different concerts. YouTube in the living room, we were able to see a Brian Adams concert and a Led Zeppelin concert. It was fantastic. Um, another fellow who really would like to have his license, he's not going to ever get his license, and he's 72, so he's not going to ever get his license now either, but he has a steering wheel and just wants to take us for a drive, so I pulled the chair up next to him, and on YouTube, YouTube has everything, we, uh, he wants to go to Barbados, so we brought up driving through Barbados, and darned if we didn't go for the most beautiful drive, it was wonderful. So my days consisted of all sorts of different things. Now we were also limited to being at home. Um, when we are not in a pandemic, then people are often getting out into the community. So we are helping people to get to the library, uh, being involved in swimming classes, um, walking at the tracks, uh, going out for dinner, maybe going to the movies, uh, horseback riding. There are many people who are involved in therapeutic horseback riding. Um, Whatever the goal a person might have, we're now gonna set things up into their day so that we can help them to accomplish whatever their goal is. And in, in many areas of the disability sector, including Community Living Essex, it's person-centered support. And if you've never heard that term, it just means that we take a look at the person. We don't paint everybody with the same brush. It's not, we don't do it the same for everybody. Each person, we break it down to who are you, what goals do you have, how can we as all of your network make those goals happen and it's different for everybody so hard to say what a day looks like absolutely and it is so different well i have to be cognizant of the time this hour has flown by or 45 minutes um and i think you've covered basically the ins and outs of a dsw which is phenomenal so. thank you so much your passion just exudes out of you and we've had a few comments as you were speaking about thank you so much for the respect that you show people who have a disability in your work and um, thank you for your passion and your uh, respect for people um, in the way that you present yourself in uh, working for community living. And um, we want to thank you for Mentorability Canada Project for being involved in speaking on this topic today. It was really informative. And uh, someone's Derek is saying, amazing job. And uh, Thank you so much, and we look forward to posting this on our YouTube channel for lots of other people to be able to watch and, and get the answers to their questions that they're looking for. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I like what I do, so thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> appreciate it so much, and thanks for coming and talking with us today. No problem.